Hello and welcome to the 2020 VAST Challenge Workshop. Uh, my name is Jordan Krauser. I'll be giving a brief overview of the challenge before we get into the, the meat of today's talks. So the VAST Challenge 2020 centered on this uh, internet malicious cyber attack scenario. It's the Center for Global Cyber Strategy or CGCS is a global think tank that's working with white hat hackers volunteering to protect the global internet. In response to a major malicious cyber attack, a white hat hacker group has accidentally taken down the entire global internet. Your job, your task, should you choose to accept it, is to help the CGCS respond to this outage and prevent future outages. This year, we had three different mini challenges. In mini challenge one, participants were asked to use structured data provided by the hackers to identify potentially responsible groups for this malicious cyber attack. In mini challenge two, we were asked to analyze images and texts provided to identify the specific group involved. And in mini challenge three, we were asked to design a new analytic environment for the CGCS that supports both real-time monitoring and response. I think my slides have gotten a little out of order. Give me just a moment and bear with me. So the vast challenge 2020 committee uh, comprised myself, Jordan Krauser at Smith College, Chris Cook at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, John Fallon at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Steve Gomez and Diane Staley at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and Jeremy Hack and Curtis Larimer at PNNL, and last but not least, Kristen Liggett at the Air Force Research Laboratory. We'd like to acknowledge our contributors uh, and supporters for this year, uh, the US Department of Defense, Pacific Northwest National Lab, MIT Lincoln Laboratory, UMass Amherst and Smith, uh, the Air Force Research Laboratory, Catherine Plaisant at the University of Maryland, who helps us with the Visual Analytics Benchmark Repository, and all of our volunteer reviewers and data providers for Mini Challenge 2. So our, our agenda for today is as follows. Uh, session one this morning is going to cover Mini Challenge 2. Then we'll have a brief half hour break. We'll come back in session two at 10 o'clock uh, to discuss Mini Challenge 1 and get some feedback. We'll then have a second break for lunch or a snack, depending on where in the world you're visiting from. In session three, we're going to have an expert panel uh, with five longtime contributors to the VAST Challenge who will be speaking about the role of the challenge beyond just the contest and the awards. Then we'll discuss mini challenge three, have a brief break, and we'll come back for a capstone discussion with Diane Staley on the role of design in the VAST Challenge. So with that, I'm going to hand off the microphone to Steve Gomez of MIT Lincoln Laboratory, who will introduce Mini Challenge 2. All right, thank you very much, Jordan. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So yeah, my name is Steve Gomez, uh, as Jordan said. Uh, I'm a staff uh, researcher at MIT Lincoln Lab, where I work on visual analytics and a little bit of cybersecurity and a little bit of machine learning. So. I'm really excited to, to intro Mini Challenge 2 today and to be able to talk about some of the excellent submissions we had. If you go to the next slide. So as Jordan alluded to earlier, Mini Challenge 2 this year was about image and text analysis, uh, which is really exciting for us because we know that computer vision and natural language processing are these kind of classic machine learning domains. Um, and seeing how they might be incorporated into a real world analysis scenario is really neat. Um, so the scenario for MC2 is that we've got our Center for Global Cyber Strategy, and it's looking for a group of people who might have been involved in this accidental cyber event that took down the internet. Um, so they've got uh, info on about 40 people, and they believe that eight of those people might have been behind this incident. Um, so another thing that we know about this group is that they use some unremarkable special item uh, that we call a totem 
uh, to actually signal their affiliation as being part of this group. You could think about it like a secret handshake or something like that. Um, while uh, the center doesn't know what that item is, uh, it knows that it could be confused as uh, kind of a free item that might be handed out as a conference uh, at a conference, which um, if you're familiar with how some of this data may have been generated, um, um, makes a lot of sense, right? So uh, that's sort of the setting for our problem. Um, we've got a couple kind of visual analytics research goals um, that I'll get into before we go into uh, the challenge. So the goals that we had at kind of the research level are to think about how visual analytics can actually improve um, and understand machine learning uh, outputs uh, for analysts. So how can we use visual uh, analytics to help us track the provenance of different analysis steps as part of some broader decision-making? Um, how can we use it to represent uncertainty and confidence, especially for trying to integrate machine learning components that have some inherent probabilistic nature to them? So that's the first goal. And the second goal is about demonstrating that when we have different kinds of data types, for example, um, images where we might wanna run some computer vision over them, and uh, text where we might be doing some NLP or caption understanding. Next slide. So to give you a sense of what the data was, um, the bulk of the data came in the form of these natural images uh, that were photographs. Um, you can see a sample of them here. Uh, one thing that you'll notice right away is that a lot of the uh, images have these little totem objects uh, inside them or candidate totems. Um, We've got all sorts of different backgrounds in these photos, different lighting conditions. And we've got these objects that are in all different kinds of poses. So you can see a lot of examples here of this little green turtle um, that appears in a bunch of different settings. So uh, we have these uh, images from, from these 40 people that we're trying to narrow down. A lot of the images also have these text captions that uh, are, um, describing contents of the photo or maybe alluding to uh, the, the context in which the photo was taken. Um, we also have the results of having an object recognition model run over those images. So we have this sort of initial default model that we've provided. And what we have are the results from a YOLO2 model. What that is is a convolutional neural network that can give you these candidate regions in the photos um, with a potential object class that's being recognized in those windows and some probability value uh, for, or confidence for what the classifier thinks. Uh, next slide. So that's what a little bit of the data looked like. Um, and now we're gonna get into the analysis questions. This is what we asked the, the teams to try to answer as part of their submission. So the first question was really about what do you do fresh out of the box when you are opening up that data, we want you to look at the output of the model, either uh, if you're gonna train your own model or if you're gonna use um, the, uh, the YOLO2 results that we provided and try to determine what kinds of objects were actually identified well by the model and which were identified poorly. Uh, so we wanted to see how people were thinking about quality and possible errors in those machine learning components. So if you were to start picking at question one, uh, you'd probably quickly realize that with the default model, at least uh, there are a bunch of classification errors where there are wrong labels or low confidence. Um, and that brings us to question two, which is how do you actually use visual analytics to try to co correct those errors that you might see or better understand them? So how do you represent confidence or uncertainty that the model might have? How do you actually make a process that's efficient for correcting that data because um, what the participants learned at least is that you're gonna base a lot of your deduction about who is part of this group on what those machine learning outputs might be. So we wanna have a good baseline for doing that. Um, and another part of question two was about characterizing basically who has these objects um, and figuring out what groups of people have objects in common, which be, would be really useful because if we're able to determine what that totem object is, you could then map backward and find the identities of the people who actually you know, took photos of that and possessed it. Next slide. So the third question is sort of our end-to-end -end MC2 question. You know, Who is the group that you believe has the totem and what is your rationale for that assessment? Um, as we'll see uh, later on in this session, 
Um, there were a lot of different answers for what the real totem was, and there's a lot of really interesting rationale that teams had for trying to do that kind of deduction. Uh, the last question is a process question, which is pretty typical of the many challenges that we do in the VAST challenge. So we took this choice point that happened early in MC2. Are you going to use the default machine learning model, or are you going to build your own? And we wanted to know what you chose and what were some of the challenges that came out of that? Uh, because you could be led uh, to have to address different kinds of issues if you went one way or the other. All right, next slide, please. So on the next slide, I'll be talking about um, what uh, the actual totem was and, and we can look at some of the images of it and maybe try to figure out why it was hard to detect. Um, but before we get there, I want to build the suspense and give you some observations that the committee had, as well as uh, some of the peer reviewers. And the first thing is that MC2 this year was actually really hard, um, which, which surprised me personally, because um, we have a nice kind of narrow, clean problem, I think, for using machine learning, and yet there are all these challenges that come out of that. So uh, one observation is that the initial model that we provided uh, was actually kind of poorly trained. There wasn't a lot of training data for it. So a lot of the confidence levels might have been low for recognizing objects. There might have been mistakes in the labels that were identifying objects. And that also made it difficult if you were going to create your own model, because there just wasn't a lot of training uh, data for you. So another, another observation is that this was a challenge where visual inspection by the teams was really important, because you had to have a way of going and correcting the data. Um, you know, some teams actually attempted to go through and, and manually review, you know, the thousands of images that we had to, to correct their labeling. Um, of course, even if you have the time to do it, to do that, that might be error prone too. So we wanted to see creative solutions for cleaning up that data. And this was very hard. Um, the third observation is that we had these text descriptions and captions uh, for a lot of the images. But not all the teams actually use those. Um, and some teams used some of the text data, but not others. Um, so in some cases, that text data might have been helpful for actually you know, better identifying what was in those images. And some of those captions actually had really interesting flavor text to them. So uh, they added a little bit to the narrative of what was going on. And there were some teams that really read into those interpretations um, to build their kind of final understanding of what they thought the totem was. So the final observation on here is that the totem itself as an object category uh, was actually poorly identified by the models that we saw in the submissions and, and by the default YOLO2 model. Um, so that was interesting because some teams actually made choices based on how hard it was for the model to recognize a particular object class. Uh, and they might have made a choice to discard that object class as being the totem because they thought, well, the totem's probably some prominent object that might be detected well. Or maybe there need to be kind of multiple occurrences of the totem uh, in order for it to be, <clears throat> you know, to have confidence that that's sort of a special item. So if you made choices like that and they didn't really align with, with what we were actually saying in the, the problem, or in the ground truth data, then um, you might have been a led astray. Next slide. So uh, to cut to the chase, the totem was this little voice recorder keychain. Um, you could think about it as maybe being like three centimeters in diameter, and it was this little black plastic recorder that had a speaker on it, had a record button, and a little keychain loop. So not the most typical object, considering that some of the other categories we were looking for were you know, a pencil, a little deck of cards, a pair of sunglasses. So this had kind of kind of an ambiguous or odd shape. It turned out that if you did a, a perfect job at being able to map between who has what object classes, um, this was the only object class that existed for exactly eight people. Um, that was a really important clue to remember from the problem setting for MC2. Um, and if you had that mapping, you could then look backward and find the individuals that are listed on this slide um, who are the ones that possess that keychain. Uh, we'll note that there are actually nine images of that voice recorder um, because one of the people who owned it actually took two pictures uh, of that um, device. So that's interesting because you, you did have to actually pay attention to, you know, who has which object types and make sure you're not double counting in the case that people 
uh, took multiple photos of their items. Next slide. Uh, so momentarily, we're going to get on and, and watch some of the um, videos that were submitted by the award and honorable mention winners. Um, I want to start by just highlighting a submission that it didn't win an honorable war award, but we thought that um, it did an excellent job. Um, this was a team at Purdue, and they worked really hard on optimizing detection confidence. Um, so what you can see from this screenshot here is that there were a lot of different views where they were trying to visualize the, the confidence of the classifier across different object categories. And that's a theme that we're going to see in a lot of the videos for uh, the submissions. Um, so we just wanted to give them a shout out. Next slide. Uh, so to get us started on the talks, um, we had one award winner um, and two honorable mention awards. And we're going to start with the award winner. Um, this was an excellent submission. Uh, we're going to hear a talk by Shi Cho in a second uh, from Tianjin University. And uh, we decided to award them for having a strong visual design to support classification and task focused filtering. Um, so there were a lot of really creative ideas in their solution. Um, and we're going to go to the video momentarily. I just want to remind everybody to please leave their questions for the authors in um, either the YouTube uh, chat or the Discord chat. And then we'll have a few moments um, after the video plays to be able to ask them some questions. Uh, so without further ado, let's check out their video. Hello everyone, my name is Shi Chao Jian. I'm going to present our work called Viral Detective, the solution to the vast meaning challenge too. This work is done in collaboration with Zhe Yuli and my supervisor Jia Wan Zhang. This talk covers five sections, including the background, gaps, and challenges, our visual analytics approach, the visual design, and finally, the insights we discovered. First, let's look at the data set. The data includes three parts. The training images contain 560 images with 14 different kinds of objects, and each object has 12 images. The primary data set for analyze contain photos and tests for 40 people. Some photos are captioned, most are not. There are some sentences that are not combined with images. Besides, the vast challenge provides the output from a pre-treat object detector. The output contains the detected body boxes with labels and confidence values. The challenge asks us to first examine the model outputs to evaluate the prediction quality for each object. This process aims to inspire the analyst to correct classification errors. Specifically, we need to quantify and understand the uncertainty of the predictions. Besides, we need to realize which person has which objects and identify groups of people that share the same objects. Hopefully, by combining the ball of steps, we can identify the white hat group behind the back. Here, we discuss the final task in detail. One tip we got is that there is a subgroup of eight individuals who share the same object. If the object detector has decent accuracy, we can easily find the group. But what if there is one more group, like group B? Here, we got another tip is that 
they rarely met in person. What does that mean? Take the example of Group B. Two persons of the group took images that took in the same place, and one person has a sentence that describes a similar scene. We can make an assumption that these three persons may have met in the same place. Therefore, Group B may not be the white hat group, since some of them have met in person. While、well, Group A may be the right one. Notice that there may be over interpretation for the second tip. Nevertheless, this interpretation of the questions influences following analysis pipeline and inspires us with a unique approach for this challenge. Now we map the questions to the wheel tasks one by one. The first question actually lets us to quantify and realize uncertainty. We solve the second question using interactive object detection to improve the model with human in the loop. For question three, we can view the relationship between the persons and objects as a bipartite graph. So we can solve it by realize a bipartite graph. In order to discover whether some people have met in person, for question four, we need to realize both images and sentences. At the same place to discover the hidden relationship, we conclude this task as multi-modal data visualization. However, it's very challenging to achieve the real task. For example, for task one, the challenge only provides us the confidence values of detected body boxes. The confidence value is only the maximum predicted values of all the objects. It does not tell us how possible the model misclassifies a detected body box. Therefore, it's difficult to evaluate the uncertainty with only the confidence values. Besides, only the model outputs cannot enable us to provide feedback to the model and improve it. Finally, it is also challenging to analyze both images and test simultaneously. To support our method, we decide to first retrain our own model. We choose state of art object detector, Yolo version three. We manually add body boxes first for the training data set. After training the model, we extract the probability vectors for the detected body boxes or the test images. The probability vector tells the probability value of each object. This step enables us to evaluate uncertainty and interactively update the object detector. The pipeline of our approach, namely visual detective, is shown here. The strategy for this method is a visual interactive labeling, specifically. We first extract the embeddings of both images and test. Then project the two spaces into the same lower dimensional space using canonical correlation analysis. Finally, we visualize the shared space using the dimensional reduction technique to help the analysts explore the images and sentences simultaneously. To improve the underlying object detector, we first visualize the predictions to show the relationships between persons and objects. The analyst can interactively correct images within the annotation window to update the underlying model. Specifically, probability vectors for the body boxes. With the same labels can be viewed as the same fuzzy cluster. To understand these fuzzy clusters, we visualize them using parallel coordinates. Besides, we list all the parallel coordinates as sparklines for easy comparison. The top items in the list are item objects with more certain predictions, while the bottom ones are uncertain. For example. 
the top three objects have high scores, each with accessible peak in parallel coordinates, while the bottom three objects have several low peaks in parallel coordinates. The order of the objects is measured by our proposed goodness metric. We provide an example of how to calculate it with bounding boxes A and B. The confidence values of both are the same. Notice that A has two very similar bars. Therefore, by adding some noise, we can easily flip the label of bounding box A. So, A should have more higher uncertainty than B. This exactly measured by the one worth two value. Also, we have considered other metrics such as entropy. However, the uncertainty of B is higher than A using entropy. Based on the one worth two metric, we define that a boarding box is predicted well only if it is confident and certain. Therefore, we define the goodness metric as this. Finally, we average on the goodness of each fuzzy clusters. Then we sort the list based on the averaged goodness metric. In order to realize the relationship between the people and the objects, we realize the relationship as a bipartite graph. However, directly plotting all the edges will cause viral clutter. Therefore, we bundle the edges using a bi-clustery algorithm. This technique is called bi-set realization. Specifically, there are three lists of the bi-set. One list is the person list. The dark blue bar stands for the number of the object this person has. Another list is the object list. The dark blue bars represent the number of persons this object belongs to. While well, the setter list is a bi-cluster list. Each item stands for the persons who share the same objects. We can order the object list either based on the alphabet order on the goodness metric. Besides, the leaks between the persons stand for the leaked person may have met in person. For multimodal data realization, we leverage canonical correlation analysis on CCA and dimensional reduction. First, we get the image embeddings from the backbone of the YOLO version 3 model, that is, darknet. Besides, we extract the status embeddings from the transformer network. Therefore, we get two high-dimensional spaces, one for images, one for statuses. In order to realize the two spaces in the same space, we use CCA to embed the two spaces into the same lower dimensional space by maximizing their correlations. Then, we realize the shared space using the TCNI algorithm. For each image status pair, if their distance is too small in the two space, we only realize their center to remove viral clutter. Now, I present a usage scenario. In the scatter plot, we can hand over the data points to examine their predictions. Besides, we can filter the by clusters we are interested in in the by set realization. Clicking the item of the sparkline list can show the details of the selected fuzzy cluster in the parallel coordinates. Meanwhile, the selected data points will be highlighted in the scatter plot. Now, look at the second person. We can find that this person does not have any objects. It is impossible. We first select all the images of this person. 
Then click the edit button to invoke the annotation window. We can find that the confidence value of the detected object is too low. Therefore, we can fix the body boxes. Besides, there are some objects missing, so we can interactively draw body boxes and label them. Once finished, click the Save button to save the annotations and fix the next image. After we have corrected the 20th image, we can click the Submit button. These 20 images will be set to the training pool to train the object detector. The progressing bar shows the training progress. After several iterations until all the images are either corrected or examined, we get the final results on the right. We can notice that there are four objects, and each object is shared by eight different persons. Now we want to exclude some objects by examining whether the persons have met before. We present some insights we have bought. For example, we find these three persons may have met before since they have similar images in the same scene. The Kanda pencil is also shared by two persons. These two persons may have met before because the two images contain the same blue shoes. The ribbon cube can also be excluded because two persons seem to be friends. Both of them share the same dolls and toys. By analyzing the images and the sentences in the same 2D space, we can discover an interesting story. For example, these two persons may be friends, as one person seems to give the 3D printed black hook to another person. In conclusion, we present a video analytic framework, leveraging interactive object detection to complete this challenge, combining several techniques for each task. Thanks for your attention. All right, so we are back. Uh, we've got Shicho, and we are able to ask some questions. So just as a reminder, um, if there are other questions that uh, folks have on their brain while we have a couple minutes, um, please drop them in the Discord or on YouTube, and we'll we'll post them here. Um, so let's go with the first question, uh, which is from uh, Huyn, who said, how do you decide if the people in one group met in person besides comparing the similar images captured in the same scene. Uh, for example, you mentioned you know, seeing shoes uh, that appeared in different uh, photos of the same object class, but on different people. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, because we got a tip that uh, the people in the some group may not may not have met before in person. So uh, if two people have people have images on test that uh, describe a similar thing, that means these people may have met before. So besides compare similar images, we also uh, enable users to compare the semantic in both images and uh, test. For example, if the settings describe the similar things in the images, we may include that these two people may have met before. Great, uh, thank you. Actually, I have one that's kind of related to that. I really loved in your slide seeing that warning early on that said, uh, you know, what interpretation exactly, you know, there's always a risk of over interpretation. Um, yeah, especially in the vast challenge where we're trying to synthesize uh, data and there might be artifacts that even uh, the committee might be unaware of. Um, so I was wondering actually just how you balanced, you know, when you're trying to make a choice, well, it could be this totem or this other totem, like, how concerned were you about reading oh, into the details is... of those captions or, you know, maybe seeing those visual artifacts where you're like, well, maybe this is due to something else, or it could be part of this narrative that you're mentioning of, you know, whether people are getting together. So is that something you were, you guys were really mindful of? Yeah, at the early stage of our developing our solutions, we have found that uh, when we debug the model, we may have several uh, possible two terms we have found. So how do we decide which one is the re real total? So we uh, search the uh, we search the uh, description of the of the question, and uh, we found that some clues may uh, say that. Uh, Mm, they have never met before. Absolutely, we may think this is maybe the errors in the uh, in the question, but we decide to uh, uh, provide a solution that's beyond the settings of the WAS challenge. Great, thank you. Yeah. So we've got another question. Um, it says, when you reposition the bounding box during that kind of correction user interface that you had, can the user assign a confidence score or is it assumed that if the user is adjusting the bounding box, you know, they feel perfectly confident? So is there, a, I guess, is there a way for the, um, the user to indicate their own, uh, you know, lack of 100% confidence when they go to, to adjust some of the data? In this, in this solution, when user correct to the body box and add the annotation, we think that the uh, user is 100% one per, one confident of the, his uh, correction. We not yet uh, provide the uh, option to give the uh, confidence of the uh, correction. Great. I think we have time for a couple more questions. So um, there's, a, there's a couple that are about how you actually retrain the image classification model. Um, one person asks, um, how fast is it to retrain? And uh, another asks, how are the ground truths of the retrain generated? Uh, for the first question, yes, uh, this uh, solution has its own scalability issue. Uh, when we train the 20 image and uh, is uh, uh, and uh, uh, update the predictions of the other images, uh, it needs 10 or 50 minutes uh, to update the whole visualization. So maybe in the future, we will provide a more uh, uh, more promoting solutions such as progressive viral analytics. For the second question, uh, uh, I have forgot the second question. <laughs> uh, the second question is um, when you're doing the retraining, how do you um, generate the ground truth data uh, that's going into it? 
actually related there is no data. no ground truth. Okay. No ground truth. When we correct the images, we we let these images as a training set and uh, uh, let the other images as a test set. There is no ground truth. Got it. Um, I think we have one final question, um, which is, uh, do you think you spent more time building your classification model or building the, the visualization and, and these different views that you guys put together in your solution? Uh, I think we spent more time on discover, on uh, providing the realization solution than the a classification training. Yeah, we have actually several uh, circles of the uh, visualization design. Great, so I think we are out of questions um, and we might be ready to start the next talk a little bit early. Um, so thank you, Xicho, that was wonderful. Um, really enjoyed your talk. Um, okay, and thank you. Let's see, um, could we bring up the screen share for uh, the second talk? All right. Uh, so uh, we just saw uh, the, the kind of award winner for Mini Challenge 2. Uh, and we're going to go into a period where we have two talks um, from teams that won honorable mentions and both did fantastic jobs. Um, so this second talk, uh, was for effective use of visual encodings for correcting classification errors by a team at Arizona State. Um, and this is another theme in MC2 this year, right? How do we actually fix these classification errors? We saw how the, uh, the previous talk did it, um, and we felt that, that this submission uh, in particular had a, a strong focus on being able to improve some of those errors and, and building uh, UIs to do that. So um, we will, I think, move into uh, Jim, uh, Jinbin Sak, um, if you could please uh, leave any questions in the Discord or YouTube, then we can uh, kind of come back and, and throw some questions to the team. Uh, so with that, we will switch over to the video. Hello, everyone. This is Jinbin Huang from Arizona State University. Today, I'm representing my team to present our submission, Totem Finder, to the Mini Challenge 2 of the Boss Challenge 2020 this year. This submission is a collaboration of me, my lab mates Aditi Mishra, and Anjana Aran Kumar, and we're advised by our advisor, Dr. Chris Bryan. So let's get started. What I'm going to talk about in the next couple of minutes are the design rationales of our visualization system, which consists of three interfaces that are used in a sequential manner to facilitate data verification, data distillation, and visual analytics. Along with that, I'm going to talk about how this three interface system helps us tackle this challenge. So without further ado, let's first look at the data and the tasks. Let's begin with the data. The data set contains 900 images on which 4,400 object detection predictions have been generated by a machine learning classifier that the challenge organizers trained. These images are social media posts from 40 people and Inside of these images are 43 different objects. The ultimate task we're asked to perform in this challenge is to identify a totemic object that symbolizes the affiliation of a group of eight people. That's also where this name of the system, Totem Finder, comes from. With that being said, what we need to do is essentially to look at the available images and come up with a network that connects people and objects according to the relationship of who owns what and what belongs to whom. Then on this network, we perform analytics to figure out which one of the 43 objects is the totem. Our system is designed surrounding this idea. So now let's move on to have a look at the first interface of our system. That is interface one. As we all know, a common visual analytics approach is to start by providing an overview of the data set, and ours is no exception. So before zooming in to detailed investigation, we can first look at the data set from a high level. This interface will also let us access the results of the machine learning classifier. We first plot the classification results in a multiple visual chart in which the classification results are grouped by the predicted category 
which will give us 43 bit swarms. And each prediction is represented as a dot in the chart. So as you can see from this initial chart, the distribution of the prediction results is very imbalanced. Many classes don't even have predictions, so it's apparent that the classifier has issues. But how do we correct them? As there are over 4,400 predictions, it's a non-trivial task for us to just inspect them in an efficient manner. So we started thinking of ways to tackle the challenge efficiently, and then we realized, hey, we're dealing with image data, which itself is visual information. So why don't we process the images in batches by taking advantage of human visual system? Well, that makes sense. In other words, instead of reviewing images one by one, let's look at them in batches. We do this by allowing the user to click a this one reference image, like this one over here. That's a reference image for Canada Pencil, which opens all prediction images for that class. The user can then quickly select and mark correctly classified images, which will turn to a green color to indicate the correctness of the prediction. If the user wants a closer view on the image, the user can simply hover on the image, which will then be magnified on the left side of the image gallery for better inspection. The Bisworm chart interface turned out to be quite efficient. We are able to mark all the 4,000 predictions in about two hours as either correct or incorrect. While it's great that many images were correctly classified, we now have a problem that overwhelmingly many other images are incorrectly classified or misclassified. So what do we do about these images? To deal with this, we developed another interface that allows us to correct misclassified images, that is, Interface 2. Interface 2 is designed to fix all misclassified images from which we expect to obtain reliable network data of the aviation relationship between people and objects. The network needs to be reliable because the analytical target poses a tight constraint on our analytics, which is that the totem must be connected to exactly eight people, no fewer, no more. So even a single incorrect connection between a person and an object, that is, an object that doesn't belong to a person has been labeled as belonging to that person can lead to incorrect analysis. So to make it simple, we want something that helps us inspect each individual image for each person and outputs a table in which rows represent people, columns represent objects, and the IJ element represents the number of object J that person I has. So whenever we see an object in an image of a person, we should be able to let the system know about it, and the table should be updated. And that's what we want. Having said that, it makes sense for us to design the phase 2 as a customized image explorer in which the user can add a label to an image or to a bunch of images to indicate an object occurring in the image or in the group of images or deletes a label when an object doesn't occur but the label is attached. The images are grouped by person, so the user needs to first select a person which will open up all images for the person. The user can then scan through the image gallery, select a batch of images that have the same object occurring in, and as labels for those images as being shown here. The batch processing design, which is also applied in Interface 1, helped us finish this fine labeling process very efficiently and again in only two hours. So at this point, we've gotten a distilled network, and now we're ready to visually analyze it. Now let's have a look at Interface 3. To visualize the network we've derived using Interfaces 1 and 2, we first use an ontology graph in which a rectangular node represents an object, a circle node represents a person, and the link between an object node and a person node represents the fact that a person has the object, the width of the link represents how important the object is to the person, measured by the frequency of occurrence of the object throughout all images of the person. But as you can see here, the graph is a bit messy simply due to the fact that there are many objects and people. To make it neater, we added a filter interaction so that only object nodes that we care about and their corresponding people nodes will be displayed. Uninterested nodes will be hidden an object nodes can also be clicked to open all images that the objects occur in. 
The images are grouped by person and colors, as can be seen here. This is the image gallery that has all the images of some objects. Then, the thing we care most about an object is how many people it relates to, because the totem we want to find relates to exactly eight people. So we added two filter bars to the panel to filter out any object nodes and the related people nodes. If the object nodes has fewer than X or more than Y related people, both Y and X are user specified numbers. The filterable graph itself can handle tests three and four very well, as can be seen here. And this is how the graph looks like after the filtering. In addition to that, to make sure our analytics is comprehensive, we also added some auxiliary visualizations to reveal other aspects of the network. The bar chart at top left shows the number of people each object relates to. The sortable matrix top right sorts people according to how many common objects they have. Here, person six and four has four objects in common. So if we click the sixth row for person six, person four will be sorted to right below person six because four is the largest number of common objects we have in the data set. These two interfaces provide two supportive evidence when we are in the course of coming up a conclusion after filtering out all objects that do not have exactly a related people, we're on to our journey of finding out the totem. Due to the dearth of time, we won't be able to present the analytic process here, but if you're interested in how we figured out the totem, please see the video demo accessible by the presented link. To wrap up, we developed a system for data verification, data distillation, and data analytics. Since we're dealing with image data, the idea of batch processing and image gallery are applied many times, in designing our interfaces, which we felt very efficient for our needs. So this will be the end of our presentation. Hope you've enjoyed our talk. Thanks for watching. <clears throat> sure. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, so now we have an opportunity to have some Q&A with Jinbin. Um, if you have other questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We have uh, uh, about five, six minutes to be able to answer questions. Um, and I think the first question that we'll start off on is um, sort of putting you on the spot, because we do have more time, uh, to maybe give us a rundown of how uh, you actually determine the totem, even if it's just in broad strokes, because I know you don't have your your uh, visual system here to illustrate it. But mm -hmm. yeah, so our rationale for the totem. Um, so first of all, we actually didn't uh, reach the correct answer. I believe we kind of <laughs> messed up a little bit. Uh, we our, our conclusion is that the candle pencil is the totem because when we're re relabeling the data or correcting the data, we kind of uh, made some miscorrection connection, sorry, because our, our um, system relies more on manual um, correction, but we, we actually made it very effective, but still um, it's kind of error point. So we reached some conclusion that is seemingly correct, but turns out to be incorrect. Fair enough. Um, so one of the questions that I have is, I really loved seeing that bee swarm plot. Um, you know, there, there are cases where that kind of encoding, you know, has some interpretation issues or maybe like a little bit fuzzy, but I felt like it was a really good 
application here. And so I was wondering how you guys arrived at that and um, whether you considered other kinds of visual encodings for, for doing that initial look at you know, what the classes were and what the, the you know, correct predictions were versus incorrect ones. Yeah, so I believe in the very beginning, I have tried like scatterplot or something else, but um, because there are just way too ma many classification results uh, for a thousand something, so we feel we have to like make it clearer and separate each classes. So, and after several iterations, we eventually arrived to that design that we are going to use this one chart. And also that's um, thanks to my professor. He contributes the idea. <laughs> So we have a question from Jordan. Um, so hindsight is twenty twenty. If you had this challenge to approach again, knowing what you know now, um, you mentioned that you guys got a, led astray on the Canada pencil. Um, what, if anything, would you change about your approach um, to maybe see if you could get onto the right track? Yeah, so I would say I would try to add more automation into my system. And because when, when I started doing this project, I'm kind of novice. And I like that has to do with my own belief into the role that visualization plays in HCI. Because I believe that H visualization should enable users. Because um, while like in the spectrum of HCI, you have like um, two ends. At one end, you have like fully automation, and the other end is like fully human control, um, leaning toward the human control. Um, and so, I believe uh, we should enable users to um, investigate the data set or explore. So that's why I designed the system in that way. But now in hindsight, I would say I would definitely try to add more automation and auto detection into the system so that it can be less at a point. Mm -hmm. So another one that I had um, watching your presentation, I. I I saw that part where um, you had your node link diagram and you you encoded the the edge between an individual and a particular object class and, and its thickness was based on the frequency or how many photos that person had of that object, um, right. which you had this hypothesis, I think, that said um, this object might be really important if you took multiple photos of it or if you had multiple photos. So. Yeah. Um, I was curious if that ended up being something that was part of your analysis. Um, and is that is that a, a kind of encoding that you decided on before you, let's say, knew how many duplicate items there would be, and then you visualized it and had some reaction to it? or or was that the bit was that that choice based on sort of looking at some of the data ahead of time and then, you know, deciding, oh, this might be an important feature that we want to look at? Yeah, so that decision is actually based on, uh, looking the data ahead and then made because yeah it's more like a heuristic after you look at the data yeah did that end up playing any role in the determination that you, that you had about the Canada pencil yep um, actually we uh, have computed like um, there's a metric we computed called stability which means like how is the data distributed among I, I mean how is the object distributed among the owners and we see that, so, so for each person, he has multiple images and each image contains one object. So we found that Canada Pencil, uh, the sp stability of Canada Pencil is actually more, I would say higher. So which means that every person has a, a stable amount of Canada Pencils in, in his image sets. And that's why, uh, we are led to that conclusion. All right. I think we are ready to move on to the next talk. Um, so we will get that uh, screen share switched. And uh, thanks again, uh, Jin Bin. That was a, a wonderful talk. And thanks for those answers. Thank you, Steve.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, so we're on to our final talk of this session. Um, this last talk is uh, for our second honorable mention winner for MC2. Uh, and this went to a team at Texas Tech. Uh, we'll see the video uh, by Huynh in a moment. And their honorable mention award was for detailed analysis of patterns of misclassification. Um, and as we'll see, this team did a wonderful job at really looking at cases uh, where the classifier was making mistakes and trying to actually understand you know, the nature of those mistakes, maybe due to occlusion or other kinds of confusable object classes. Um, so we're gonna switch to the video in a moment. Uh, just a reminder to please leave your questions in the Discord or on YouTube. Uh, and we'll have a few moments at the end to be able to put those to the authors. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. I'm Huynh Nguyen from Texas Tech University. Today, I will be presenting our system for misclassification, correction, and analysis using visual analytics. I will be representing our team, including me, Huynh Nguyen, Jake Gonzalez, Jian Guo, Nguyen Nguyen, with our advisor, Dr. Tommy Da. I will talk a little bit about the challenge and the VIS MCA overview. Then I will go through data preparation, visual analytics, totem fighting, and then I will conclude by talking about what we have learned from this experience, which is quite interesting for me. The first section is about the challenge and the VIS MCA overview. In the mini challenge two, we are given the output of an object detection model. Our job is to first examine and evaluate the results. Then we correct the misclassification and then we'll analyze the pattern to find the totem, which is a secret item. By doing so, we can improve the understanding of the machine learning output to track provenance and the confidence as well as the uncertainty in the machine learning output. Here is the VIS MCA overview. After data preparation, the first module we are working on is detection distribution, where we evaluate the machine learning result. The second module is misclassification correction. This is a pipeline to produce the corrected label, and then we can export the output as a CSV format. The third module is the pattern analysis, where we plotted multiple visualizations to see the underlying pattern of the misclassification. The next section is data preparation. In the data set, we have more than 900 images, more than 4,000 detections. These detections belong to 22 classes, and in total, we have 43 classes. These images belong to 40 people, and beside images, we also have caption and text. In data processing, we use Python and OpenCV for image direct annotations. This one is for fast rendering later. And then we use that for object batting box clips from the original image. The next session is visual analytics. Here is the interface of detection distribution. We can either mark the true positive or false positive by right click, or we can choose to mark multiple detections at once. Either way, the ranking at the table on the left hand side is updated and this ranking is based on the confidence score and then you can see that the precision and recall curve is also updated in here we use the ap as the auc curve to see the average precision here is the interface after correcting and marking this classifier, AP, is about 20%, which is not very high. However, the metal key classifier is one of the top five highest AP of all categories. The highest one is blue sunglasses, with the AP of about 36%, which is also not very high. This interface is for misclassification correction. This panel is for selecting the person 
The next panel is for selecting the labels divided into two sections. The detected section is for the labels that are already assigned to the image, sorted by the confidence score. The second section is for the alternative, meaning the remaining labels, sorted from the A to Z. The next section, we have the Save button to update the um, selected labels to the table over here. And uh, we also have the Difficult uh, button is for marking difficult samples because sometimes the difficult samples can be treated differently in different machine learning algorithms. Here we can choose to uh, this display the image as original or annotated. Here I choose the annotated one with the labels and the bounding boxes overlaid on top of the image. Here is the caption of the image provided by the dataset. In the last panel, we have the table for all of the images that are already assigned a label. We can export the data in this table as the CSV format for future use. After getting the corrected labels, we use that data and original prediction data for pattern analysis. Here, the corrected data is represented by the green square, and the original prediction data is represented by the brown circle. The size is proportional to the number of occurrences, and the opacity of the circles is proportional to the average confidence score of that particular classifier. The overlap between the square and the circle means the correct predictions. With the proper ordering of the labels, we can observe several interesting patterns. For example, from person 37 to person 40, we can see they have the same object of red dark. The several, several clusters can be observed, such as the turtle, the carabina, the cactus paper, etc. By looking at the overlap, we can have a rough idea of the accuracy of the prediction. For example, person 33. There is a large amount of predictions. However, there is only one overlap, meaning that the classifier is only correct about one class. The next visualization is a network between people, objects, and images. We use this to explore the relationships between them. For the complete network, it's really complicated, so we need the graph filtering to simplify it. We can filter based on the confidence score or the person notes. This is an example of the filtered graph revolved around the Canada Pencil. We can see that there are eight people having the Canada Pencil, and we can also see the mutual objects that these people have among them. The next visualization is a list with links repurposed network. In this visualization, the people are arrayed in a vertical column in the middle, and the objects are in a circular setting. In this um, visualization, users can quickly find the group of object, a uh, group of people sharing the same object or the set of objects that one person owns. For example, the Canada Pencil here, we can see the eight people connected to it. This is the distribution overview, and uh, we will use this to reflect on the machine learning result. There are 43 classes in total. In the classifier results, there are only 22 classes detected. The number of true objects which is 1,370, is less than one-third of the detected objects and distributed quite evenly among all of the 43 classes. The number of true detections is higher on the right side, in green. It is around 53%. That means the machine learning model missed out at least 53% of the objects, hence not a good model. The next session is totem finding. The totem is shared between the subgroup of eight people. 
We examine the objects that are shared between eight people. These include the rainbow pens, Rubik's cube, and Canada pencil. The number here is the ID of the person having that image, having that object. For each object, we examine the people having it. The number here is the number of images that that person has, including the object. We can see that person 1 has only one image containing the rainbow pens. Person 6 and 8 each have only one image containing the Rubik's cube. We argue that in order to use the totem, the person having it has have to have at least um, two images representing the sending and receiving signals. So after this, we believe that the Canada pencil is the totem. In the second rationale, we look at the distribution overview. We can see that the Canada pencil are, is the one that has the detection among all of the categories. However, the rainbow pens and Rubik's cube does not have any detections correct. Therefore, this one will set the Canada pencil aside. And after this, we believe that the Canada pencil is the totem. The next section is what we have learned from this experience. The first one is the understanding of machine learning results. By marking true positive and false positive, the ranking of samples and the precision recall curve are updated accordingly. It is helpful to see the impact of high ranking samples to the average precision. In the two images up below, you can see that the average precision here is about 20% and this one is about 15%. But the marking of true positive and false positive are largely similar. The only difference is the one with the highest ranking. You can see that this one it is marked as true positive and this one is marked as false positive. And this small uh, difference can make the precision and recall curves are largely different here and here. And uh, then it leads to the differences in the average precision. The second thing is the efficiently correcting misclassification. The correcting misclassification step can be further improved by using the patterns from the misclassification to suggest labels. These two stages of misclassification correction and pattern analysis can be complementary and carried out sequentially with small steps. One of the recognizing the pattern might be the examining the nesting balloting boxes between two classes. This one means that if one balloting box um, of one class is repeatedly observed to be within another balloting box of another class, this can be a um, pattern to mark the two classes together. The second um, pattern can be observed is the similarity in the intersection of a union or the IOU between batting boxes. It means that if a set of batting boxes are overlapping with each other and this pattern is repeatedly observed and this can be seen as the pattern to mark multiple um, classes together. Okay, thank you so much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you, uh, Huynh. So um, I guess we'll start off with a question that I had, which was, you know, if we look at that matrix view that you showed um, for how you were looking at your um, classification errors versus the true positives, um, did you have any insights about um, the individual persons who didn't have a lot of overlap? I know that one of your axes was kind of who the individual are, who the individuals were. Um, yes, that's a very good question. So, um, so for our submission, we're more largely focused on the um, groups of the objects that are often misclassified rather than the individual that having their object misclassified. I think that's a really interesting direction because we can always group these people that are often have having their objects misclassified and then um, the dig deep into that and to see some of the patterns that um, what makes their objects are often misclassified. And we might some saw some patterns there. Yeah, the reason why I, I asked that is, you know, you could imagine for this, you know, scenario and where we have, you know, sort of a secretive image, you know, there might be individuals yep. trying to obscure their objects or, or it could be an artifact of how we're actually producing the data for the vast challenge. <laughs> Right, yeah. Uh, the synthetic scenario. Um, so another question that I had was, um, uh, let's see, whoops. So in the case where you had to choose between the three object classes that you identified that all had eight people, um, one of the things that you said is that we believe that um, you know, it made sense that the true totem would have two instances. And I was curious how you, um, your team kind of settled on that as a hypothesis. You know, was it, was that more of a rationale once you were trying to find a way to choose between these or was that something that you discussed beforehand? Okay, so after we route up to find these three objects and um, we think that what my might have set the totem aside from the rest and um we think that okay so in order to be a totem it might have been at, at least two images for each person to have um we mark it like the sending and receiving signals and um so for a person that have only one picture of the totem we set it so it might not be the the person that we are looking at. um we are Fighting. And uh, behind that is just for the sending and receiving um, rationale for the total. Got it. Thank you. Is that answer the question? Uh, yeah, I think it did. Uh, we've got one. We've got one from Jordan um, that says. Um, the downside of the conference talk format is that we only get to see the highlights of the end result. Were there any wrong turns that your team took in working with the challenge? And if so, what did you learn from them? What did they teach you? Okay, that's a very interesting question. So um, while we're doing on this challenge, we took many different directions and sometimes we got stuck in one and uh, then we go back and try again. And what are the uh, um, uh, direction is that we try to look at the uh, um, IOU, the intersection over union overlap. So for several images, if we have the same set of batting boxes of the same um, groups of labels, if these um, overlapping batting boxes uh, repeatedly appear in different images, how can we see that as important to relabel re the images in batches instead of one by one. And um, we found that because the, uh, the result of the object detection model was so poorly um, <laughs> produced. So uh, that, that might have been a good uh, pattern, but it's kind of messy. It's just a messy result um, from the object detection model, but not really a pattern also. So. And um, so from this experience, I guess, um, what it really teaches us is we should um, run another model, uh, another object detection model and compare these two 
results to really see that if that would have been an, uh, a pattern or so, or we just looking at some random pattern and we might not see it as a complete pattern for the decision model. Got it. So thank you very much. I think we're, we're out of time on the Q&A. Um, but I want to thank you for, for your talk and for answering our questions. Um, and maybe we can switch back to the, the slide deck as we sort of wrap up this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, welcome back. Um, and so first of all, I wanna thank all of the speakers uh, for their talks and for answering our questions. I absolutely wanna thank our, our tech, uh, Kieran, who's been helping us so much uh, with this session so far. Um, right now we wanna kind of wind down session one. Um, and I wanna remind everybody that they should check out the Vast Challenge posters. If you go to virtual.ieee.org, um, you'll see that there is a, a poster section at the top, and we actually have four vast challenge posters, which represent some of the work from the teams on Mini Challenge One and Two. Um, so please check those out. You can actually filter for the vast challenge posters inside that uh, poster view. Um, so now we're going to go into a break. Uh, we'll all kind of come back together at ten o'clock, um, where we will pick up and learn about Mini Challenge One. Um, so thank you everybody for attending so far, and We'll see you after the break. Thank you. Data videos are quite popular nowadays. They usually show changes in the data. However, creating a data video requires multiple skills, and the process is usually laborious and iterative. Our approach focuses on automatic and interactive visual enhancement of important changes in time series data with data video. Hands-on cybersecurity training represents a domain where vision analytics can significantly improve the impact of teaching process. We describe this new application domain and introduce a conceptual model that can serve as a framework for the development of analytic visualizations. Unified training lifecycle will be discussed from the perspective of different user roles. We present TransFIS, a design study that is proposed to analyze and integrate close and distant reading of multiple translations. TransFIS presents the overview of the collection to capture global patterns that is facilitated by the ADM VIP matrix. TransFIS integrates a detailed view to explore interesting path of alignments. We also propose the TLC view to examine and explore the terms of the user selected path to justify and reason the AD analysis. Uh, testing environment for continuous color maps. Many other fields in the computer science do it, we should do it too. With our work, we introduce the approach of using test functions as a standard evaluation method. We present a test suite for continuous color maps implemented in the CCC tool. Adapt the tests to your requirements at the interactive testing section and observe them at the testing evaluation section. Entities and their changing relationships can be modeled more precisely as temporal hypergraphs. But hypergraph models are difficult to explore and refine. By leveraging domain-specific geometric deep learning models and a new multi-level hypergraph visualization, our technique allows for the direct integration of domain knowledge into the machine learning process. The multivariate hypergraph model structure can be analyzed in different abstraction levels. Simultaneously, experts can integrate their domain knowledge on the fly and then explore the refined machine learning model. Attention mechanisms have greatly improved the performance of many language models, yet with great power comes increased complexity. In this work, we present attention flows, a visualization that lets users interpret the language model's decisions and gain insights into the underlying self-attention mechanism.
We also support model comparison that helps to fill the gaps between models in different training stages. We asked participants to recreate bar graphs. When the bar was alone, we saw a different pattern of error than when the bar was presented with context in a stacked bar graph. We find that absolute error increased for higher bars when they were presented alone. We also found that there was a bias in the responses such that they were repulsed from an implicit 50% mark. We found a magic number, 10%, to predict error. Participants are usually within 10% of the height of the bar. We propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. Do these three essays construct their argumentation similarly? Where in this table of argumentation data from the previously seen texts can I find certain argumentation patterns? Do these three argument maps depict the same argument? We have developed a visual analysis system for argumentation in essays that can answer these questions at a glance. You want to know how it works? Come to my talk. We demonstrate that people can use the spatial cues available in virtual reality to help them effectively remember and recall scholarly articles. We used a virtual coffee shop and asked participants to remember four abstracts from scientific publications, and we termed this method a virtual reality memory palace variante. Program developers spend significant time on optimizing and tuning applications. But working with binary code to understand what compiler optimizations were applied can be challenging. We present our visual analytics system, CCNAP, designed to identify and assess compiler optimizations in binary code. Check out our paper to learn more. This is a picture of a Tableau visualization within the browser. The data behind the visualization does not exist here, and Tableau is not running. This is just an image. However, parts of this image are fully interactive. Please join our presentation to see how we can share interactive visualizations across the web, free from any dependency on data or visualization application. We present PowerViz, a tool for visualizing hypergraphs where edges can connect any number of nodes. PowerViz is the first technique to display hyperedges with no overlap or crossing. Vertices are represented as rows, time periods flow from left to right, and groups can be shown on the left. We designed the layout for readability. PowerViz shines with mid-size hypergraphs and it allows detailed analysis. We tested PowerViz successfully using publication datasets and data from historical documents. Mars complexes have shown a great utility in understanding the topology of complex scientific datasets. The noise in the scalar field, however, can significantly distort the Mars complex topology. Hence, we study the extraction of Mars complexes for ensembles of noisy scalar fields through their uncertainty visualization using our proposed statistical summary maps. We present NL4DV, a toolkit that helps prototype natural language interfaces for data visualizations. NL4DV provides a high-level Python API for interpreting natural language queries. 
the API automates the core tasks of processing natural language queries to infer relevant information and determine appropriate visualizations, allowing visualization developers to focus more on designing and implementing the user interface. We present Lyra 2, a system for designing interactive visualizations by demonstration. To design interactions in Lyra 2, users directly manipulate the visualization canvas. The system interprets demonstrations using heuristics and suggests possible interaction designs. We find that Lyra 2 enables rapid prototyping of an expressive range of interaction designs. We're excited to share this work with you. The classifier trained on the historical data may fail to classify the incoming data when the data distribution is changing. This phenomenon is called concept drift. To handle the concept drift, we developed the DriftViz, a visual analytic system to help the expert understand when, where, and why the drift happens, and update the model to improve performance. Position is believed to be the most precise encoding channel, but our perception and memory of it can still be biased. Past work has shown that the vertical position of bars in a bar chart is recalled in a biased manner, illustrating both an underestimation and overestimation bias of position. Here we find that the aspect ratios of the bar marks can cause this position bias, specifically resulting in overestimation for bars with wide ratios and underestimation for bars with tall ratios. Visavis is a visual support system for the development of visualization algorithms. It has live compilation, automatic version control, predefined interactions, and tools for visual parameter analysis. By displaying the complete history of the algorithm, users get insights into the correlation between source code changes and visual differences. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Spot SDC is a visualization system that helps researchers understand the resiliency of HPC computation kernels to silent error corruptions. It gives users multiple perspectives of details with different granularity about the impact of SDC on an application's output. It also provides novel insight into how silent error propagates through a program's execution. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. How many clusters can you see in these images? With different visual encodings and scatter plots, our perception of cluster count changes. We developed models that consider how visual density influences cluster perception. Further, we demonstrate using a threshold plot to optimize the saliency of clusters. In our current work, we visually compare two cohorts of segmented and classified tissue images originated from single-cell omics data. To that end, we developed data-driven and interactive workflow implemented in a multi-linked view system. 
Finally, we show the effectiveness of our workflow through specific case studies. Suppose you want to see the overall coming structure of a new project repository. Using git class tools, GitHub network, or git log command, it's quite burdensome to get overview and navigate data. We presented Gizru as an interactive visual analytics distance for the Git metadata to help users explore and understand the context of development history. Several recent studies advocated the use of non-parametric density models for the improved characterization of data uncertainty. The non-parametric models, however, present the challenges such as increased memory and computational requirements. In this work, we propose an efficient non-parametric framework for volume rendering in the context of uncertain data and show their effectiveness in classifications via comparisons with the other statistical models. Taylor coir flows is a turbulent fluid motion created in the gap between the two rotating cylinders. The traditional reason-based methods are only able to capture the small-scale coherent structure. The detection of the large structure depends on the 2D uh, cross-section, which is not the true configuration. We adapt the feature level set methods and the density estimation to combine multiple attributes and use them at the filter to separate large and small-scale structure. Digital humanities present great opportunities for testing new visualization approaches and evaluation techniques. However, and given the diffuse character and novelty of the field, it may also be intimidating for novel and senior researchers willing to get started in the discipline. In this paper, we propose a data-driven analysis of visualization for the digital humanities to identify key themes, authors, and relevant publications. So if you want to know more, please read our paper. Confusion Flow is an interactive visualization for the performance analysis of classification models. It introduces a novel temporal adaptation of the confusion matrix, which lets model developers compare the learning behavior of multiple classifiers over time. Find out more about confusion flow in our talk or in our TVCG paper. Text alignment is a fundamental technique in many text-related domains. In this survey, we cover three text alignment scenarios, collision task, text reuse detection, and transition alignment. On the basis of those scenarios, we review the existing text alignment visualization approaches and discuss their advantages and drawbacks. We finally derive design implications and shed light on related future challenges. White space surfaces are a novel approach to convey depth in vessel visualizations. The core idea is to shift all additional depth cues away from geometry and to use the usually empty space between the vascular structures. This allows us to display functional parameters on the surface and supporting cues on the background. We will explain how to generate such surfaces and how to use them as a canvas to further enhance depth and shape perception. Imagine you have tons of text data to analyze. And you want to get an overview of your data, but traditional topping modeling techniques such as LDA are not working for you. Then, why don't you try Architext? We introduce a scalable and flexible way to interactively build hierarchical topics. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. All of the distribution samples refer to the test samples not well covered by the training data, like these black cats. They are misclassified with high confidence due to their black bodies. 
to explain why these samples are out of distribution, we developed OD Analyzer, a visual analytics tool which provides an ensemble detection method and a grid-based visualization to detect and analyze out of distribution samples. Serum graphs are variants of stack graphs with curved baseline, and the main factor affecting its readability is the sign allurance through a perceptual inconsistency of the orthogonal and vertical direction. Aiming at reducing its impacts, we revisited the baseline formulation and proposed the concept of composition to help the serum graph layout optimization. The result shows that our algorithms perform better than the others.